We have two more weeks left in the Psalms. This morning, we're going to jump right in. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 67. Psalm 67. If you don't have a Bible, we have some blue ones on our welcome table. Those are our gift to anyone that would like a copy of God's Word that is in the same translation that I preach from. We have some blue ones on our welcome table. They're welcome to grab one of those. It will also be up on the screens or on your phones or wherever uh, you want to find it. Uh, open your Bibles to Psalm 67 and let's uh, allow the words of this psalm to direct our worship this morning. It says, it's under the heading, it says, All will praise God. For the choir director with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. Verse 1, May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us. Selah. So that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy. For you judge the peoples with fairness and lead the nations on earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has produced its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would open our hearts. I beg for you to open our hearts this morning. To understand your word, that you would move your spirit through our lives as we study your word. That you would convict us and affirm us and change us. God, not by anything funny or witty that... I may say or I may try to say, but God, by the power of your word, in Jesus' name, amen. It says, all will praise God. So the main idea I want us to consider this morning is that the blessing of God has been poured out on people for the glory of God to the nations. So think through this. The blessing of God poured out on people for the glory of God among the nations. Blessing people, glory, nations. Blessing people, glory, nations. This psalm is really a prayer. It's a song of a prayer that the writer is begging God. He's He's pleading with God here. And a lot of this is going to sound familiar, maybe in a few Old Testament um, Old Testament references. If it's not familiar now, hopefully by the time we end it this morning, it will be familiar. We're going to look at some Old Testament references that are, are basically quoted or referred to in this psalm. This is a, a prayer, and you know, some people will say, well, Paul, you know, the Great Commission is the last words of Jesus, so the mission of God is a New Testament concept. But I think we see in this psalm that the mission of God has existed for as long as sin has been in the world. See, this is a prayer. This is a prayer that probably is similar to, to millions and millions, maybe even billions of people, at least the first verse of this prayer is probably familiar to, to many people because it's how we pray. It's, it starts with a request. It's how we pray in verse 1. The, the psalmist says, may God be gracious to us and bless us. May, his make, make, may he make his face shine upon us. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us. Now, we may not pray in the same words, but it might be, God, keep my family healthy. God, forgive me of a general concept of sin. You know, if I've done anything wrong, forgive me. And give me favor at work. I would say probably billions of people pray this kind of prayer, at least what we see in verse 1. And it stops there with a period. The request is, God, fill my bank account. God, keep my kids safe. Please, Lord, don't let them rebel. Let them be productive. Grow into fine adults, good jobs and good spouses and whatever. 
Let us live long lives and healthy lives and die quietly and peacefully. Period. See, that's, I would suggest, that's how billions of people pray. And we see this request. It's, it's similar to what we find in Numbers chapter 6, which is the, the priestly blessing. It says, in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26, this is what Aaron and the priests were to, to bless Israel. God commanded them to bless Israel this way with this priestly blessing. He says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You know, very similar. If we see the, the first verse in this psalm, Psalm 67, verse 1, it's very similar to the priestly blessing. Lord, bless us. Lord, be gracious to us. Extend your compassionate mercy to us. Make your face shine upon us. Now, we don't, we don't probably don't speak like that, right? We probably don't go to our boss and say, I would like for your face to shine upon us. <laughs> or go to our spouse. Well, yeah, I do say that to Victoria. Victoria, I would like for your face to shine upon me. But the picture here is of an approving king, approving of how his people are living. The picture is, is one of approval, or maybe more personally, an approving father to his son or daughter. Make your face shine upon us. I think billions of people pray at least how verse 1 starts us. God forgive me. God keep my family safe and give me favor at work. And see, I, I think part of that is that we don't really understand what it means to be blessed by God. So if, if you were to say, I've been blessed by God, how would you respond? What's the first thing that comes to mind? You think about the blessing of God. Provision. Provision? Material. Wealth, right? Provision. Uh, provi not wealth, but, but to provide materially. Is that kind of where you're going? Yet, our needs. Yeah. Somebody else. Family. Family. Family health, right? Those are wonderful blessings, right, Laura? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Absolutely. See, have you ever heard someone say, well, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. That usually means everyone's healthy. Usually. Everyone's healthy. Things are going well at work. Right? How are we doing? Oh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. here's the rub. See, I think we need to define the blessing of God not according to 21st century American culture or even 21st century American church culture. But I think we need to look at the blessing of God how, it, how God has addressed our greatest need. That's what Laura said. Forgiveness. Our greatest need is to be reconciled to the God of the universe through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the greatest need for people for the last 2,000 years since Jesus came. And even before that, that's the greatest need since sin has been in the world, to be reconciled to God. See, the blessing of God, while we like to think of it as provision or help or just peace in our family, all of those are good things and all of those God uses to bless us. The primary blessing of God is life in Christ. The primary blessing of God is to be saved from our sin and saved for a new way of living. And that is wonderful, wonderful blessing. God be gracious to us. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May, his, may, may he make his face shine upon us. The, the compassionate mercy of God, the graciousness of God. Think compassionate mercy, salvation, life in Christ. God blesses us in other ways, absolutely. Let me just tell you that the fact that we woke up in America with a roof over our head and running water makes us among the wealthiest 
and the wealthiest 10% on the planet. Like, that's not a very high standard. I've been to places where they will carry a 50 pound bag of bananas down a three, well for us, for me and John, it's probably a three mile hike down. For these you know, 10 year olds carrying bananas, it's probably like a 30 minute hike down. Where they will carry a 50 pound bag of bananas down a mountain hoping to sell it for 50 cents. Hoping to sell it for 50 cents. If you've traveled globally, you know that Living in America, just the fact that we wake up in America makes us some of the wealthiest people on the planet. Not just America, but we could be in Dubuque, Iowa, Idaho, Iowa, Iowa. One of those. Something. One of those miserable places. We could, I have a friend that's from South Dakota. Oh, see, I'm so funny, she spilled her water. I have a friend that's from South Dakota, and I'm like, thankfully, you found it to break it to, you know? We live in paradise. We live in one of the greatest cities, one of the greatest regions in this country. We have been blessed by God just by being allowed the privilege of waking up with freedom for, to worship, freedom to worship without consequence, freedom to pursue education. I mean, the school here, an incredible school. All of the schools that we prayed for this morning, all of the schools in our county afford us incredible blessing to our children, to the children of our communities. But all of that is secondary. All of that is maybe even tertiary on the outer rings of the periphery. The primary blessing of God is and always will be reconciliation. Life being, being reconciled to God the Father because of Jesus Christ. As we consider the main idea this morning that the blessing of God is poured out on people for the glory of God to the nations, let's look at this next verse. And in verse 1, we have the request, and in verse 2, we have the purpose. It says, So that your way may be known on earth your salvation among all nations. So that. So that. So that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Several years ago, I heard a pastor, a guy about my age, just an incredible preacher um, called David Platt. He said that the word that is the most important word in the entire psalm. In our, our translation, it's the word, so that. Because whatever follows the word, so that, or the phrase, so that, tells us the purpose behind God gracious, God's graciousness and his blessing. So he says, may God be gracious to us, may he bless us, may he make his face shine upon us. It's not a period, it's a comma, and it says, so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. We see that the purpose, the purpose there, the purpose of God's blessing doesn't stop with us. The purpose of God's blessing is not between Victoria and me, our four kids. The purpose of God's blessing on the groom family isn't for the groom family or whatever family it is. The purpose of God's blessing, your salvation, and every other peripheral blessing that you have is to take the gospel to the nations, period. To your neighbor, to your co-worker, to the nations. The purpose of the blessing of God does not stop with us. Sadly, most of us live as if it does. Myself included. If we're really honest, most of us live as if the blessing of God upon our families and starts and ends with us. It was never intended to stop with you. Because the blessing of God has been poured out on people for the glory of God to the nations. It has never, ever, ever been intended to stop with you. Another pastor, R.C. Sproul's his name. Older guy says, 
one of the worst things we can ever do is to waste the gifts God has given us. One of the worst things we can ever do is to waste the gifts God has given us. He says, so that. Most important words in the entire psalm. So that. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. So that. This echoes the, the call of Abraham or Abram. You know, if you're, if you're reading the book of Genesis and you see, like, in the early chapters, Abraham is called Abram. It's not a typo. Like, when I was a kid, I was convinced my Bible had a typo in it. <laughs> Lots of typos in it. Until I read through Genesis and realized that God actually changed Abraham's name to Abraham from Abram. Abraham. It's not a typo. But in Genesis chapter 12, this is the mission of God in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 12, the call to Abram was this. He says, The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land I will show you. No GPS, no blueprint, no, we're going to Marietta, no, we're going to Bradenton, no, we're going to Naples. We're not going to let you guys go to Marietta, by the way. Check your car. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But no GPS, he just said, go, go out from your land, your relatives, your father's house, to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. There's no period after the word, I will bless you. It's not period because the blessing of God is never, ever, ever intended to stay with the person. It's always for the glory of God among the nations. There's no period there. It's a comma. He says, I will bless you. I will make your name great. Again, no period. And you will be a blessing. I get a little excited when I see this. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. When he says all the peoples on earth, he's talking about us. Because when this was written, we were in the ends of the earth. When the New Testament was written, when Jesus says go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, we are the nations right here. Christianity did not start in America is not centralized in America. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. See, God poured out his blessing on Abram and his descendants so that all the families on earth shall be blessed. And here's the point. The blessing of God is never, ever, ever intended to stay with you or with me or with my small family. Well, my small family is not small, but you get my point. It's never intended to stay with us. It is always intended to spread. It, and as it does, God is glorified. God will be glorified as his blessing is spread across streets, across ball fields, across schools, and across oceans. God is glorified, period. Because God alone saves sinners. Like, I don't save anyone. You don't save anyone. That burden is not ours to carry. God alone saves sinners, and he saved me, and he continues to forgive me. He continues to show his compassionate mercy, his graciousness to me, not because I'm awesome, but because he is. And he has called me to take his message to everyone I meet, and he's called you as well. If you are a Christian, you have been blessed at your greatest possible need. You have been given life in Christ through repentance and faith, through following Jesus. If you are a Christian, you have been blessed, and your greatest possible need has been met, not to end with you, but to spread the glory of God to the nations. And as, as the people of God embrace the purpose of God's blessing to take the gospel to their neighbors, their co-workers, their friends, their family, their softball teams, their soccer fields, and all over the world, God will always be glorified because some will repent and believe and find that, find that life that Paul writes about. Find life in Jesus' name because some will repent and believe. 
some will repent and believe. Because God has poured out his blessing on people to take the glory of God to the nations. Verses 3 and 4 says, Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy. And then he, he flips the coin here. He talks about the character of God. We talk a lot about the character of God. It has to inform everything we do. The character of God must be instrumental in what we do personally and corporately. He flips the coin on the character of God. For you judge the peoples with fairness. You are a righteous king. You are a fair king. And that is reason to rejoice. That is reason for the nations to rejoice because you're not an oppressive, evil, vindictive king. You are a righteous king for you judge the peoples with fairness and you lead the nations on earth. He's pointing to God's character there in the midst of his prayer. <clears throat> and then we see this word Selah in the margin. In mine, it's in the right margin in italics. Don't really know what that means. It just means stop and think about that. Stop and think. The psalmist is saying, let the nations praise you. Let them shout for joy. Because you are a righteous and a fair king. And lead the nations on earth. Verse 5, we see that there's a guarantee. Verses 5, 6, and 7. It says, let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has produced its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. God will bless us. And all of the ends of the earth will fear him. Look at that phrase again. And all the ends of the earth will, will, will. Not might, not hopefully not some, but all will fear him. As we go across the street to take the blessing of God in our lives to our neighbors, as we go to the cubicle next door to our coworkers, as we go to the families at the softball field and the soccer field and the swimming pool and the classrooms, we can trust that God is drawing people to himself all over this city, all over this world. And one day, all the nations of the earth will fear him, will fear him. It points us to the sovereignty of God over the nations. And that is a glorious truth that God is absolutely sovereign over all things. And that is the fuel for our missionary zeal, that God is a sovereign God. And he is drawing people all over this planet to himself. We see an absolute guarantee. And that's pictured at the end of the Bible in the, in the seventh chapter of Revelation. If you want to turn over there, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. See, John gets this vision, and he's told to write down what he sees. And here's one of the things that he sees in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. He says, After this I looked. And there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. We see verses like that as an absolute guarantee that our missionary efforts will be fruitful. An absolute guarantee. Because what John saw was a picture of people from every nation, tribe, people, and language. All encompassing. People from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language. Yeah, people and language. Worshiping before Jesus in white robes with palm branches. I mean, that's really good news. We should pair that with Psalm 67, 7, where it says, and all will fear him. Those are two guarantees that should fuel us to walk across the street to share the gospel to our neighbors, to walk to the office next door and share the gospel with a coworker, 
to invite an unchurched family into our home to share a meal so we can share the greatest news in the history of the universe. See, the blessing of God is poured out on people for the glory of God among the nations. <clears throat> I was really long-winded last week, so I'm making up for it this morning. Here's what I think we need to do with this song and this truth, where he says, May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. I think the first thing we need to do with this song before us is that we... have trusted in Jesus through repentance and faith and are following him, we have experienced the most incredible blessing. We need to refuse to put our focus on the blessing. Instead, we need to keep our eyes fixed on the blesser. Refuse to focus on the blessing. Instead, fix our eyes on the blesser. Some people will say that you know, salvation is a ticket out of hell. In fact, I've, I've heard of a children's program at another church in Manatee County where they, they claim they're going to punch my ticket. That is so short-sighted. Because it, it, we, we think of it as tra transactional, as this blessing, more as transactional rather than relational. That it's the start of a journey, not a one-time transaction. I had a friend in college, really good trombone player, pretty wild guy. He told me once, he said, that's all right, Paul, I can do whatever I want. I got my fire insurance. Oh, I'm so sorry. That, that conversation with this guy, this really, really talented musician, nice guy, friend of mine, I will never forget. That's over a 20-year conversation. I will never forget. He said, that's all right. I've got my fire insurance. Because somewhere along the line, he bought into this transactional approach to Christianity rather than this relational, where it's a one-time thing. Get my ticket. Focus on what I got rather than focus on the greatness of God. See, salvation starts in a moment and continues for a lifetime. So we refuse to put our focus on the blessing. Instead, we fix our eyes on the blesser. We chase long and hard after Jesus. We follow Jesus in the ordinary rhythms of life. We allow the ways of Jesus to inform how we live, to inform how we work, to inform how we go to school, to inform how we worship. We allow the ways of Jesus to form how we live, work, and rest. So that's the primary blessing. What about a material blessing? God has blessed every person in this room materially. We woke up in America with a roof over our head and running water. We're among some of the wealthiest people in the world. And see, what, what does that look like when we apply it to the material blessing? Is that we can focus on all the stuff that God has or hasn't given us. I see this in my boys. They focus on always wanting a little bit more. Always wanting a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Because their focus is always on what they haven't been given. But see, the opposite is, can be bad too, to focus on all that you have been given. Because that, that's when we become a hoarder. You ever see those shows, Hoarders? You ever have to go into someone's home that was a hoarder without a hazmat suit? Woo! Boy, it is awful. You can smell the home of a hoarder. It's just, if you've never experienced, I just pray that you never will. But we can, we can focus on all that God has given us or focus on all that God hasn't given us. Either one of those is focusing on the blessing rather than the blesser. See, when we focus on the blesser, we approach God like this. I'll never forget, I was talking to my uncle, he's a pastor, and he said, you know, Paul, 
this is right when I was starting in ministry. I was leaving uh, the, the, the secular workforce ministry. And he said, you know, Paul, I've always approached life open-handedly. That God has given me everything that I have. Even my ability to earn a living is a gift from God. That's in Deuteronomy. He said, God has given me everything I have, so why in the world would I close my fists on it? God has given me everything that I have, every relationship, every asset, every ability has been given to me by God, and he's free to take it and use it how he sees fit for his glory, because he's God and I'm not. See, when we focus on the, the blessing, we like to do this or this. But when we focus on the blesser, we realize that even the gift of today is to be used by him how he wants to use it. You say, God, take it all for your glory among the nations. My health, my wife and my children, my ministry, my material assets, everything, everything that I have is a result of your compassionate mercy on me, and none of it is deserved. Everything that I have is a result of your compassionate mercy on me, and none of it is deserved. There is no such thing as a self-made man or woman. If you believe that myth, let's talk afterward, because it's nonsense. It does not exist. No such thing. As a self-made man or woman, no such thing. It says, everything that I have is a, is a result of your compassionate mercy to me. God, take it all, take it all, take it all. Anything that you need, that you want to use and redirect is for your glory among the nations. Across the street, across the globe. So we focus on the blesser and not the blessing. Number two, I think there's another thing we need to do in response to this song and in response to being in Bradenton, Florida this morning is that we need to refuse to buy into a Christianized version of the American dream. We need to refuse to buy into a Christianized version of the American dream. St. Augustine says, Find out how much God has given you, and from it, take what you need. The remainder is needed by others. Find out how much God has given you, and from it, take what you need. The remainder is needed by others. It's a crazy, crazy idea. What would it look like if the people of God looked at all the material blessing that God has given us and said, you know what? I don't need it all. In fact, I don't even need most of it. In fact, I'm going to cap my lifestyle at a certain level, and I'm going to refuse to grow in or grow beyond that next paycheck. I'm going to cap everything, and everything above a certain level is for the Lord. Everything. What would that look like? How might that make our lives different? How might that show that we actually believe that God has been gracious and blessed us and he has made his face to shine upon us so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations? Invest in kingdom ministry. Invest in great commission purposes over and above a biblical tithe, a, a biblical tithe of a tenth. What if we, we draw a line, not a line in the sand, but like etch a line in cement saying that this is enough. I don't need any more. I don't want any more. I realize the blessing of God, the material blessing of God is given to me for the glory of God among the nations, not for my own quiet enjoyment or not so quiet enjoyment. Dora and I, I'm saying this with, with her permission, that's where we landed a few years ago. We believed that God was calling us to adopt, and we had no idea how we were going to pull it off, like zero idea how we were going to pull it off. And we looked through a 
spreadsheet, he said this, 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 over and above our tithe to our church. This, this, this. It's all got to go. It's all got to go. And for our family, we made a conscious decision to fix our lifestyle, to not allow our spending to grow into whatever raise we may or may not get, whatever bonus we may or may not get. Because we know that God had called us to bring this little boy to our family, to adopt him as our son, not as our adopted son, but as our son. Just a side note. If you ever know an adoptive family, don't say, well, you've got these kids and you've got then your adopted kid. They've just got kids. They're just pastoral exhortation. Adopted Sean Coates as our son. No idea how we were going to pull that off. But we knew that God had called us to it. And we knew that God had blessed us with resources for his glory among the nations. And we slashed. And we slashed. And we slashed. And we saved. And we, we realized that there were things we could do, but things we were going to choose not to do. Because the glory of God among the nations is more important than a vacation or eating out a couple extra nights a week or whatever it is. We knew that there were things that we could do, but things that we were going to choose not to do. Because God had been compassionately merciful with us and had blessed us in incredible ways for his glory among the nations. Little did we know that Victoria took as a 16 year old girl in high school in upstate New York God would use her SAT score to help us fund our adoption because she got a bonus based on her SAT score which went straight toward our adoption absolutely incredible how God works how God blessed us and our greatest possible need with salvation and has blessed us in peripheral ways beyond that in that we have decided in our family that enough is enough the American dream doesn't matter that there are more important things it frees you to be generous it frees you to be radically generous with people with ministries to meet practical needs knowing that everything I have is because God has given it to me God has, has placed it in my hands, and I'm keeping my hands wide open, period, for his glory among the nations. As we go across the street to our neighbors, and we go across oceans to the nations. Lastly, a question. So two things to refuse Refuse to focus on the blessing, instead focus on the blesser. Refuse to buy into this Christianized version of the American dream. Fix our lifestyles so that we can give more to kingdom purposes, to great commission purposes in the world, because enough is enough. Lastly, a question. Who in your life would say you're being a blessing to me. Would say, thank you for blessing me. Thank you for being a blessing to me. Do you know someone that, that can say, you know, Constance is constantly a blessing to me. She's praying for me. She's texting me words of encouragement because she knows when things are awful and she has been blessed by God at her greatest possible need, salvation in Christ, and she is using that to bless me others who would say Alexa you're a blessing to me Charles you're a blessing to me Amanda you're a blessing to me who would say that follow up is who do you need to bless may God be gracious to us and bless us may he make his face shine Upon us so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let's pray. Heavenly
Heavenly Father, God, I pray that each one of us here, God, would know the blessing of life in Christ and would see the mercy that you have shown us, the compassionate mercy that you have shown us. God, we love you.